Hi everyone, welcome back to the Navigant Credit Union Broadcast Center. I'm Go Local News Editor Kate Nagel. Just had House Finance Chair Marvin Abney here in studio to provide us with an update following yesterday's meeting with revised financial numbers for the state of Rhode Island. Appreciate his time bringing it right to you here in studio. We're going to stay local with a little bit more of an international context. I have Dr. Richard Grace from Providence College, an expert on the British monarchy, British history around the corner. It's in the news a lot these days. What is the state of the British monarchy? Dr. Grace, please come and join us here in the studio. Thank you very much. Come on over here. I'm going to bring you into the box. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> and I'm going to let you talk right to the viewers if you want to take one okay. step back here. Okay. About the state of the British monarchy in 2017. There's, of course, a lot of interest with Harry getting engaged with the family itself, with a queen monarch who has been at the helm for 65 years. She's seen a lot of changes. We have seen a lot of changes. What, in your estimation, have been the most profound changes under Queen Elizabeth? Well, if you look at the uh, time that she's been queen since the middle of the century, the loss of the British Empire is, is one thing. The controversies within her own family uh, is another thing. The constitutional changes, such as the um, pretty much the death of the House of Lords, there have been a lot of changes that she's seen in her time. I'm going to bring you a little bit closer over here, Professor, yeah. so we can get in the shot. So a lot, you know, the British family the, uh, gets so much international attention when anything takes place. But we talked a little bit about really the tumultuous time with the passing of Princess Di that really kind of people took a step back and really took a look at the British monarchy and its place and role and purpose. And it, of course, has survived. But was that sort of one of the biggest hits that it has taken, that people really questioned the role of the monarchy? Yes. After the death of Princess uh, Diana, the queen was slow to respond. And the uh, reaction from the public was quite negative. And the Queen recovered somewhat by giving a televised uh, a speech to the nation the uh, day before the funeral. And it took a while for the temper of the country to come back to, uh, let's say, a greater appreciation of the role of the monarchy in their lives. It is the, the uh, most significant monarchy in, in the world at the moment. And to the British people, it's not simply a constitutional thing because the Queen is the head of state, but it's also a ceremonial thing. The British tend to do ceremonies better than, <laughs> better than anybody. For anybody who's ever seen Trooping of the Color in June on the Queen's official birthday, it's uh, you know, a spectacular splash of color. <laughs> and as you mentioned, again, under Queen Elizabeth, seeing the essential collapse of the British Empire, and we do have a population of people for whom they knew, obviously, of its prominence, you know, we all look at history, you know, we're, we're myopically focused on where we are, but in the yeah. grand scheme of things, as we said, it's not going anywhere per se, but it's not the powerhouse it once was. And once we get a generation or two removed from that and those yeah. folks who knew it to be such, what is its ultimate role ceremonially <laughs> moving forward? Yes. Well, that, that was the thing that, that uh, Dean Acheson said, that the British uh, hadn't figured out a role for themselves in the world after they had lost the empire. Uh, and, and the British people had a hard time dealing with the backwash of empire because after the middle of the century, there were so many people from the empire who wanted to live in Britain rather than living in Pakistan or Kenya mm -hmm. or Jamaica mm -hmm. that there was a great influx of uh, um, people from around the world that Britain wasn't really prepared for at the moment, and they, it, it was uh, not simply a matter of racial attitudes, it was also a matter of the expense involved in bringing all these people into a new welfare system. And this sort of plagues, plays into the uh, uh, news about uh, Meghan and Harry, because Meghan is uh, a, a biracial uh, person, uh, which shouldn't make a difference in a multiracial Britain now, but the fact that uh, Brexit showed a sort of, uh, the, the Brexit vote so had a sort of racial aspect to it, a fear of the foreigner, a desire not to have more foreigners coming into Britain. Mm. That, you know, 
there was a sort of ugly side to Brexit in that respect, and, and I hope that that won't uh, have any effect on the way in which the British people accept Meghan. Now, Queen Elizabeth surely did, again, American divorcee, actress, all things that in past decades would mm. sort of raise flags. Is it an indication of the monarchy sort of being in the 21st century and saying, we are multicultural, we understand the world in which we live? Well, the last time uh, uh, an heir to the British throne, uh, uh, Harry isn't, isn't uh, likely ever to be close to uh, um, wearing a crown, mm. but nevertheless, he's in line. Mm -hmm. The last time that happened was when the Prince of Wales in 1936 wanted to marry an American divorcee, and all hell broke loose at that point. The Prime Minister, Stanley Baldwin, and the Archbishop of Canterbury, in effect, ganged up on Edward VIII and told him, you can have the woman or you can have the crown, but you can't have both. <laughs> Had to uh, make that choice. Situation. And he did. <laughs> <laughs> he did. He, he, he chose the woman, and he chose to live the rest of his life out away from Britain. Um, in, uh, in these circumstances, most of those factors don't come into play now. And here we are, 2017. It's often known as the firm the monarchy is, running it sort of like a business with Queen Elizabeth at the helm as yes. calling the shots and having folks having their roles within it. But when they mention the firm and we think of business aspects to it, how much wealth is there in the monarchy? There are two answers to that. One is the personal wealth of the queen. When somebody estimated it at 100 million pounds about 20 years ago, the report from the palace was, no, that's vastly overestimating. But uh, I've seen a recent uh, indication that her personal wealth could be as high as three quarters of a billion pounds. I'm not sure, I haven't had a chance to check the accuracy <laughs> of that. But we do know that the Crown Trust is worth somewhere in the neighborhood of seven to eight billion pounds. That includes properties such as the Crown Jewels, which she couldn't possibly sell. Mm -hmm. there, there, are, there are real estate properties and paintings and the jewels and so forth that technically belong to the crown, but they're not hers to dispose of. Mm. And does that just go on in perpetuity? As you said, you can't really touch the crown jewels, some of that, uh, those assets, so they, they just sort of, they're in a holding pattern. It's part of the national wealth, yes. Mm. There are certain properties that do belong to her. Sandringham out in Norfolk, where she'll spend Christmas, yeah, but it does belong to her. Balmoral up in Scotland, where she goes at the end of every summer, belongs to her. But there are other properties, like Buckingham Palace isn't, isn't hers, uh, and Windsor Castle isn't hers. That belongs to the nation. So let's talk, speaking of nations, and getting outside of England, and you mentioned it before coming into the studio here, big news today with President Trump declaring Jerusalem in the mm -hmm. eyes of the United States as yeah. the actual capital of Israel. Yeah. You said you wanted to just bring up for folks here a little bit of the history of the British role in the region. Well, Jerusalem falls into the story of the, of the British Empire coming unraveled after World War II. And in the period from the time the war ended in '45 until 1947, Britain tried to keep the Zionists and the Arabs from one another's throats mm -hmm. in uh, Palestine. And it was so hard that Britain had, Britain which was a destitute nation at that point in time, ha had to ha have 100,000 policing troops in Palestine. They decided that they couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. And so they tried to leave uh, peacefully to extract themselves and turned it over to the United Nations. At that point in time, the idea for Jerusalem was that the United Nations should be an international city with access to uh, uh, Muslims and Jews and, and uh, people of other faith traditions and in so Jerusalem. forth. In Jerusalem, right, yes. But in 1948, as soon as it, the state of Israel was declared and the surrounding Arab nations attacked uh, Israel, um, the outcome of the war left West Jerusalem in Israeli hands, and in 1967, as a result of the Six Day War, East Jerusalem was acquired by Israel. So the city of Jerusalem, including the old, old city, has been in the hands of the Israelis since 1967, and that's where they have most of the features, functions of their government. Now, what do you have to say to President Trump's announcement? We knew it was coming today. 
and we've heard a lot of reports sort of internationally about the international reaction right. to this. Again, why he did it and what position this does put the United <laughs> States in moving forward. <laughs> yes, that's the big question, is that why did it have to be done now and what benefit is going to be gained for the Middle East or for the United States uh, as a consequence of doing this? Maybe, maybe we'll get some explanation of it, but I haven't seen one yet. Well, again, so much going on, D.C., from both the Mueller and the Russian probe. This is just another uh, aspect of seeing what comes out of the Trump administration, but a lot of questions asked surrounding it, especially because of its implications in the international sphere. Mm -hmm. So moving forward, now that we uh, had you in here to talk a little bit about the British monarchy, where it stands right now, what, what do you predict? Do we see a solid line of succession after Queen Elizabeth with the monarchy continuing to maintain a relatively ceremonial role, but there's also right. a public one. You know, William right. and Harry both right. have quite public now with wives, yes. children. Will that keep them sort of in that public sphere even more so than just the service and ceremonial aspects? William and Harry are very different personalities. Uh, w William seems to be a much more sedate person. You know, his his. Uh, actual job is as an air ambulance operator in East Anglia. Um, Harry has served in, in Afghanistan. He's, he's been all over the place, you know. He's, he's been um, uh, a party fellow <laughs> in, in the Western Las Hemisphere. Vegas. <laughs> and he, uh, um, he's been, you know, in service with the British military. Um, a more colorful figure, you might say, <laughs> than his brother. But the interesting thing is that the three figures, now going to be four with Meghan, the three figures are deeply involved in charitable enterprises. Mm. In Britain, uh, uh, um, William and Kate and Harry are involved in a charity that uh, is uh, um, uh, devoted to the care of children with mental issues. Mm. Uh, um, in uh, Africa, uh, Harry and now Meghan uh, uh, attached uh, to the same cause are concerned with charitable uh, uh, issues in Africa and also with the environmental issues in Africa. So when you look at this, these things, it looks as though uh, the monarchy has a future that is much more than just ornamental. Mm. They are very involved charitably. Would it be more difficult if they weren't so publicly and uh, you know, philanthropically, an, an, an activist sort of, if, if they didn't take that role, would there be more of an issue with the people looking at the monarchy and asking, what, well, what are you doing? <laughs> there is a, which, uh, what you could call a Republican faction in Britain, which is constantly going to ask, why do we bother to have a monarchy? And if it didn't have these positive roles in English society, then I suppose the complaints of that Republican element would be much louder. Well, we'll continue to keep an eye on the future of the British monarchy, but the big news this past week, Harry, again, I think, what, fifth in line for the throne right now? Yes. <laughs> fifth in line, soon to be booted down to sixth after the, possibly the birth of right. the, yes. the third child for William and Kate, but wanted to get a sense from a preeminent scholar of Britain and the British monarchy at Providence College. Dr. Richard Grace, I appreciate your taking the time to come in today. Thank you very much, Kate. We'll let you go back around the corner to the tasks okay. at hand, educating the youth of the leaders of tomorrow. <laughs> Dr. Richard Grace from Providence College. Fortunate to have him down here in studio. It's always great to get our scholars at our local colleges and universities, expert on Britain, British history. The British monarchy wanted to talk about where things stand now in 2017. Very interesting historical perspective with Israel and Jerusalem following World War II, where things stand now with President Trump declaring Jerusalem the capital of Israel. It was great to have Dr. Grace here into the studio. Speaking of schools, we've got one more guest here in studio who's going to talk about an event taking place here tomorrow. We've got a student. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.